this is a really lovely opportunity to talk about the digital residencies that have happened on two continents. We have Marie Smith, who has been working at the Horniman Museum, and Adira Thekavitil, who's been with the Museum of Art and Photography, known as MAP in Bangalore. And the idea for both of them, and for all of us, was to start a digital residency that really began when we were all locked down and not able to enter museums um, during that whole COVID crisis. Um, and so that the idea of having artists in residence that could interpret what was actually in the archives and finding a way that we could actually access and just begin to understand maybe what is in a museum archive. So I'd like to introduce each of the two artists um, and they're each going to show a little bit of their, their practice and how they have interpreted the residency, which began in April and will finish in September, but we hope it's a kind of open-ended finish. Um, and so we'll start with Adira Thekavito. Hello everybody, my name is Adira. Um, and I am the artist in residence at the Museum of Art and Photography in Bangalore. Um, and this has been a very, very enriching experience, if I must say, because for me, I have never done a digital residency before. Um, and when I first got invited to be a part of this, I was somewhat sort of um, struggling to sort of put a way in which I could do something digitally. So this was a question that I was thinking throughout um, as I was sort of coming up with a proposal and an idea for what I could do. Um, and what I found was that at least for me, the Museum of Art and Photography, they have this wonderful platform called Cumulus. Um, and it is a digital collection viewing system. And so basically a large part of the MAP Museum's collection is online and available for people to access, which is fantastic and which I haven't quite seen as much in Indian museums, particularly. Um, they are often very cloistered spaces and ones which are very sort of heavily gatekept and, and you don't often get access to their collections to really know more about them and to understand them. And so I sort of started looking through Cumulus, um, in fact, and I started sort of thinking about, you know, what does it mean to actually interpret a collection and put information along with artifacts in a museum collection? And of course, I had also been thinking a lot about the contemporary debates around museums. And a lot of questions came up about what kind of information do you put? What kind of information do you not put? Which collections do you give access to? Which collections do you not? Um, and so as I started thinking about these questions, I got quite lost in Cumulus. Um, and it was a really wonderful experience because for me, it was this process of just finding things. And that is really very much like the physical experience of actually going through a museum. If you're going into, you walk into a room and you don't know what you're going to find and you go to the next room and the next room and you're not quite sure and you come up on, upon things that you might not have actually, you know, planned to see or uh, things might surprise you in museums. And this was really what was happening to me as I was going through Cumulus. So um, I'll share my screen and I'll take you through a few of the initial ideas that I was having. Okay, so what I started to do was actually go through the Cumulus website, which is a part of the Museum of Art and Photography. And now if you go and just Google Cumulus map, you actually come up to this platform and it's a fantastic space where you can actually just sort of browse the collection of map and see and encounter works that are in their collection. Um, and so if you sort of click on any of the artifacts uh, that are there, you get a little bit of details about the catalog entries. So things like the title, the artist, the date, et cetera, material and other things. And so for me, what was so interesting was one, this process of sort of finding things that were unexpected that I hadn't encountered. And because I come from a background of photography, it was also very interesting for me to look at things like popular culture and print media 
and to see really how photography was also being integrated into so many different sort of aspects of print culture, popular culture, etc., especially in India. And so what I started to do then was actually sort of really start thinking with this information. And so I started to sort of take, um, literally sort of take uh, images from Cumulus and start to put them together and start thinking about, okay, what is happening? You know, what are the similarities that I can see with images? Um, and especially with photography, you know, there was a lot of things like poses, which were quite similar and artists who had also interpreted these photographs and reinterpreted them. And this use of um, form and structure, which was also similar, but also in, in many ways, also ironic and playing on these ideas that were the, the sort of norms of photography. And this really interested me. And I started to really sort of go through the museum collection initially in that way, where I was trying to sort of find things that I could connect and that I could bring together. And as I was going through this process, I realized that what was interesting for me was the fact that I was able to think about a lot more information in the images as I started to zoom into them. And so, for example, here in the museum collection entry, there is specific information like the date. This is a photograph from the early 70s. This one was made by a photographer called Jyoti Bhatt, et cetera. And so I knew that. But then when I started looking at the photograph, I started thinking about other details that are in the picture. So, for example, this is the political party symbol. This is another political party symbol. This is a third political party symbol. And so I was thinking, oh, were there many people who were trying to campaign at the same house? Or is this something that was important to a specific kind of locale, etc.? And I needed a place to sort of put all of these thoughts into. And what I came up with was the easiest thing that I could do at the time was to do a mimicking of what I was seeing on Cumulus. And so for me, that made sense. Um, and so this is my version of Cumulus and it is called Nimbus um, because Cumulonimbus is the cloud. Um, and so, <laughs> so what I started to do was actually just sort of make my own version of Cumulus where I could add and play with a lot of the additional information that I wasn't able to sort of, you know, add into the map collection. And something else that was interesting about the map collection was that if you go into any of the collection entries, you see this very helpful prompt at the bottom, which says, uh, all catalog entries at MAP are a work in progress, and we welcome any alternative suggestions, corrections, or comments. If you would like to enrich this entry, please contact. And so I found this to be a very interesting prompt, and I said, okay, maybe I can enrich the entries, and let me, let me enrich them uh, in my own way. And so that's what I did. Um, and so on, on Nimbus, you can sort of go through um, the collection and there aren't as many, there aren't 18,000, there are going to be about 100 by the time the residency is over. Uh, but if you go into each sort of entry here, you get some of the information that is there in the map collection uh, details. So for example, the title, the date, the photographer's name or the artist's name. And then it begins with this process of me being subjectively uh, analyzing the information that I'm seeing. And so, um, and so, for example, I really start to sort of see it. I start to think about what I'm looking at. For example, in this photograph, you see a woman who is standing in front of, of a set of posters on the wall. And I was interested in what the posters are because I couldn't find information on that on the museum entry. And so I started to think about it. And initially sort of, I started to think about, okay, you know, this is a photograph where I, where I get what's happening, um, that this woman's pose is very similar to the woman's pose on the poster. And yes, you know, there's a genre in photography where, you know, you're supposed to sort of get the metaphor very quickly. Um, and then I started to sort of really look at the poster and thinking, okay, what's happening here? Um, what What is the movie? Um, and so then, I sort of started to think about that. And then I figured out that this is the film Yado Ki Bharat, which is a 1973 film. And these, you know, it starred Zina Taman, a very popular film actress. Um, and and then I, I found the movie on YouTube and then I watched the movie. <laughs> um, and then I found a very interesting moment that happens about one hour into the film, which is this moment here. 
um, where the actress or the star of the film is actually in a bathing suit. She's frolicking about a beach in a bathing suit and her lover takes a photograph of her in this moment. And so I realized that, oh, this what's happening in this picture is actually a photograph within a photograph. So there's a double act of photography happening. And so that became very interesting to me. And so then I sort of start to write about that, about, about this moment in which there is this man who is looking at her in this sort of very uh, erotic gaze and he's trying to he's sort of, he's lusting after her and he's taking his picture. But the minute he takes the picture, she sort of freezes up and she says, uh, you naughty Marungi, or I will, I will hit you if you because you've taken this photograph. And that was super interesting to me because I was like, ah, so it's actually a photograph of a moment where she wasn't wanting herself to be photographed. And that became the movie poster. And that became the background of another photograph. And then I'm wondering whether this woman who was in the frame was also sort of maybe not particularly eager to be photographed herself. And so that sort of became the fleshing out of an entry in which otherwise it was a very simple image where I was only able to get a certain amount of information. But because I was sort of very curious about what's happening, I wanted to sort of see what else I could find and what else I could maybe add to this entry. And so the idea of enriching became very interesting. And so like that, there are many more entries in this collection. So in my own version, there are it's it's a mix of subjective reflections. There is humor, but there's also um, ideas that I bring in from other connections. I look at information like dates. I look at information like where an image was found, where it was made, who was the photographer, what was happening around the world at the time the photograph was made. And so I tried to add all of these in a way in which it is both interesting, but also something where I am able to allow people to really get into the, the work um, in a way in which perhaps as, a, as just basic metadata information, it might not be as revealing. But I, for me, the idea is if you look closely and if you're willing to sort of spend enough time um, and be very inquisitive and interrogative, you can actually find some very interesting details in it. And so um, perhaps I can sort of stop there and um, I'd be happy to sort of, you know, let Marie talk about her uh, experience to residency as well. So thank you, Adira. That's fabulous. I think that gives us a real insight into the depths that you are plumbing to find that fascinating, fascinating information. OK, I think that's plenty for, for now. And maybe it's time for Marie to maybe introduce herself and tell us a little bit about her practice. Hello everyone, um, my name is Marie Smith. I am a London-based visual artist and writer. I am the artist and resident, digital artist and resident at the Holy Museum and Gardens. Um, I have had a similar experience to Adira where I sort of came into this residency not really knowing what I wanted to do or where I was, where I was going to be going. Um, with my sort of ideas and research. Um, I've been very fortunate enough to be quite local to the Horniman um, Museum, because um, I'm based in South London, and so it's a Horniman Museum. So um, I thought I'd be starting off doing something quite online and digital, but because um, I've been, I'm local, I've been able to access a lot of the resources there. So a lot of my time has been spent sort of in person, immersing myself in the institution. And I think really my um my residency has been trying to understand the institution as well. Um and um a bit like Adira, I've also been sort of using sort of online facilities to um help document my research and my understanding and to try and sort of find ways to um, visualize and to talk about the complexities of sort of doing a residency um, from a kind of individual um, subjective perspective as well. So I'm going to share my screen as well. Okay, so a lot of my research um, has been sort of accumulated onto my website. Um, I created a page. Um, where I thought it was the best way for me to kind of have a space to kind of empty my head out onto a page. And that's 
and the reason why I sort of created this space. I did something similar for another um, residency that I did where I was just sort of writing as I went along. So at the time when I started my residency, I was interested in worms. <laughs> I was looking at soil. I was reading a lot about soil. And for some reason, that was the main sort of um, prompts that I had for my residency. So initially, I met up with Perinal, um and Zelda. I was talking about worms <laughs> and soil <laughs> quite a lot, which must be weird for them. Um, but I, but essentially, the um, worms play like a very sort of essential sort of uh, feature in soil ecology. So they aerate the soil, so water can trickle through and nurture the ground. They kind of have a very kind of forward thinking way of sort of performing in terms of that ecology. And really, I think it was more that worms were a metaphor for my way of working. Um, so the whole idea of worming and being a worm was my way of sort of utilising um, to try and create these spaces to aerate, to facilitate new ways or to try and bring out new ways of thinking, either through my processes or to try and kind of extract information from um, members of staff at the Horniman Museum and Gardens as well. So, yeah, I sort of became um, a worm in that sense um, in terms of my ways of researching and there were three sections initially to um this um to my residency, my research, but I've narrowed it down to two elements. So that's the people, as in like the actual people I've been physically talking to. Um, I also had a couple of people, um, two other creatives part of my residency, um, um Angela YT Chan and um Axel Katucci. Um, those two people were really instrumental in having um, me having an outlay to talk about my ideas. Sometimes I can get a bit tunnel vision in my research, my ways of working. So speaking to Axel and Angela, two people I've worked with previously, we have a kind of similar ways of working and thinking in terms of um, sound and thinking about environment and ecology. Um, it was great to kind of have their time, have their thoughts and to have that reflective space. So they also became instrumental to my ways of thinking and researching alongside talking to um, Zelda and Perina and other people at the Horniman. So I started off um, going to the Horniman and parallel to the Horniman, there's a nature trail and this nature trail used to be a railway track um, back in the 19th century, um, but now features as like a kind of uh, nature trail where it's very sort of overgrown and wild and unprovoked by the human the human touch and um, it is a straight line so you are just walking down a straight path which echoes the previous sort of use of the space as a railroad um that space sits um, adjacent to the um, horniman so you can kind of see the horniman um and you can kind of have that distance away from it as well. So that became a space where I first sort of initiated my um, my research because I wasn't quite sure what I was doing and I was still quite obsessed with soil and looking at worms and stuff. Um, so my main thing is to kind of take pictures. Um, I'm a photographer. I, I work in black and white, analogue black and white photography. Um, a lot of what well, all of my work is made using plant or herb or food based developers. I try to use low toxic forms of developing my photographs to try and have some conscious consideration for the environment and also for my use of water. Um, so I started off looking at the nature trail because I was, just thought it was just like a really nice space. I had no idea it was there. And I was quite familiar with the Hornman before I started my residency. So it was kind of a nice surprise to have this nature trail there accessible to me um, as well. So I could go at any point, um, um, anyone can. Um, so yeah, I started off looking at um, the nature trail and I was also looking at silkworms on the um, on the Horniman um, website. I was looking at lots of different um, terms. I was, using, I was going into a search engine and just sort of typing different words and seeing what was happening. And I got um, intrigued by silkworms and how um, you know the Horniman has like this it's a space where you have all of these elements and things and stuff which has been collated 
um, extracted from other parts of the world was situated in South London. And it's not just the institution itself, it's the gardens. So these two separate spaces, the gardens and the museum, have elements of the world that were brought together there. So the silkworm being on, you know, coming from parts of India and Japan and China, being brought over to perform a function and then to be sort of categorized and kept and utilized as an object, as you can see here, it's like an ornamental object, is interesting to me. Um, that's an initial point of inquiry in terms of I was thinking about capital and labor as well and, and colonialism and try to kind of deconstruct the Holiman sort of deep um colonial sort of history as well. Um and that also led me to think about the plants and the wildlife and the nature that was in the gardens and in the nature trail. But I started to sort of think about the nature trail first. Um and I was talking to Axel and Angela as well and as I went along for the first month I was sort of just taking pictures and writing and thinking and just using photography as a, a first method of inquiry um, and I think um, as I sort of went along the residency I became sort of less focused on the online element of the of the residency and more sort of concerned and more intrigued by the kind of physical going into the space and physically um, engaging with what's in the collection and um, I was aware of Anna Atkins and her cyanotypes before I did the residency um, because I'd done some research about her as part of the GYCP grant that I was given by the Arts Council in 2021 um, and I started to make um, cyanotypes in response to looking at Anna Atkins cyanotypes um, I was also aware that Anna Atkins um, has sort of um, a legacy through colonial colonialism um, and through um, slavery as well. Um, and that also became a point of inquiry for me as someone of Jamaican heritage. It was, um, I thought this was a great opportunity for me to try and get to see her cyanotypes and to try to see if I can find a response to like that process and that history. Um, and as I was going along, I was writing and um, I started the process of bleaching the cyanotypes. Um, the bleaching method is quite popular um, as a way of sort of changing the aesthetic of the cyanotype. The cyanotype is known for its sort of fresh and blue, this deep, rich blue, which is kind of very beautiful and sort of reminiscent of nature and water. Um, but you can also change the aesthetic by bleaching it or you can tone it using tea or coffee or any type of sort of um, dye um, of some sort. Um, so I was lucky enough to be able to go to the Horniman's archive and I spent a, uh, an afternoon there um, looking at Anna Atkins' four volumes of her uh, studies in British algae as well. Um, and at the time I was sort of experimenting with sound. I have been experimenting with sound as part of my residency and also Super 8 film as well as two outlets that I want to try and explore um, further um, as part of my practice anyway. It's just that this residency gave me an opportunity to have that as an initial point of inquiry. Um, so when I was looking at Anna Atkins' cyanotypes, I was um, just recording my thoughts as I went along, just whatever came into my head, I was just sort of saying. Um, so I can play you maybe like a short snippet Every interruption with these plays is making me think that you would be looking at this book next. Where would it be going? Whose hand will also touch the page? Whose hand will be folding, looking, inspecting, reflecting on this book of British algae? And wonder how the cyanotype will be in a hundred years time, whether they would have deteriorated, whether they would have or still be the same, but perhaps one of the great things about photography is time and that time will hold instances in time. Um, if you're interested in, in listening to more out, um, so outtakes, it's on my uh, website. Um, 
but basically what you can sort of hear there is me sort of recording my thoughts but I was also very conscious I was in this space around other people so thinking about the institution and how that institution was shaping my ways of seeing um, and I was sort of thinking about um, to the camps theory um, listening to images um, to the camp is someone who's sort of like a massive inspiration for me um, and um, I sort of been utilizing her sort of ways of thinking and I've been engaged with artworks particularly archival works and in, in institutions as well um, so when I started to look at the cyanotypes I started to kind of okay find a very specific path um, that I wanted to kind of investigate a bit more so that became like a focal point um, but I still was looking at the nature trails so I met up with lots of different members of staff at the Hornman who were able to give me some very insightful um, uh, thoughts and reflections about the nature trail, about the ecology, um, about lots of different aspects of about nature and gardens that I wasn't aware of prior to the residency. So residency has been like a great opportunity for me to kind of learn a bit more about um, gardens and nature and landscape and how the construction of nature as well and thought from a kind of kind of colonial capitalist perspective um as well um so again i was sort of going through and thinking about my ways of working and and trying to and thinking about like my body and how my body was sort of utilizing these different spaces as well um but i was taking pictures of the nature trail i was making developers from elderflower that i was collecting from the nature trail um and i started to make cyanotypes as well um from the nature trail and you can see a photograph there of a dandelion as well um and then look further down there it's a cyanotype that i made um which is part of the book that i'm currently um formatting at the moment um the the, the blog this sort of blog page that i've created is is slightly um uh, is coherent and incoherent it's incoherent because i'm just going along with whatever i'm doing and it's coherent because it has like a structure of me kind of writing down what I'm doing, but it's kind of whatever's coming to mind really. Um, you can see sort of here that you know this is a developer that I made, which I kept, which I will use for future photographs that I make. Um, this is a super eight film that I made um as well during the nature trail, which I put. Let's see if I can play a few seconds of that as well make it bigger so alongside sort of thinking about the nature trail um I'm, I'm sort of I quite like to do performance in my practice as well so I sort of think about this as a space for performance and sometimes I was doing these actions and making these work like the super eight film was just like a point of inquiry but how I can sort of think about my body in that landscape. And it's not something that I've kind of gone into much detail about because I was quite interested in experimenting with different materials and I had the time and I had the sort of facilities to kind of do that um, as well. So um, I've sort of sort of had these different points of inquiries. Um, but Super 8 film is, is it's fun. Um, and it's something that I definitely want to kind of experiment more and I've not utilised it before. So I thought the residency was a great sort of opportunity for me to use it as an initial point of inquiry as well. And the good thing about when you do a residency um, is if you work with a great institution is that you are able to kind of experiment and have the time and the facilities to kind of engage in different ways of working and not always be so prescribed to like a very specific way of working as well. Um, although I work primarily in photography, a lot of my focus um, during the residency hasn't been on analog photography. It's actually been on sort of mostly writing and doing cyanotype, which is a camera form of, of um, photography. So over the months, my main priority has been making a book of cyanotypes in response to Anna Atkins' um, cyanotype process. Um, like I said before, the bleaching is my way of creating um, a response to Anna Atkins and try to have some, have some agency and some nuance as a kind of call and response sort of in conversation with Anna Atkins as another photographer 
as well who's engaging with this process. Um, I've sort of made 30 cyanotypes over the course of um, the summer. Um, I've made enough to make a book. So um, I'm just showing you here some uh, examples of the book, which is going to be called Extraction. Um, I'm working with um, Phonium Publishers, who are a South London based um, publishing company. Um, and they've worked with lots of really cool photographers. And they, I'm working with them at the moment to try and make um, the sign types into a book, um, which will be sort of echoing Anna Atkins book as well. Um, and you can see some pictures here of the the book, the first pages that of the um, book, which is one of the cyanotypes that are made at the beginning. And here are some photos of the backgrounds, which are going to feature in the book as well. So that is something I'm working on as like a kind of as an app as an output for the uh, residency as well. That's wonderful, Marie. Thank you so much. That was both of you very comprehensive. And how you manage to fit all that in months and months of research and thinking into just a few short minutes for this video. But I mean, I think what is lovely is that both of you are kind of looking at sort of the history of objects in a museum context in some form. And in a way you're deconstructing and then creatively putting entirely your own artistic practices Right, right into the foreground. I mean, I think it's beautiful. I know, Adira, that you've got some considerable work to catch up on because you had a little bit of a blip in the middle. Um, and so that, do you think that, I'd like you to address one another in this. Can you tell me, Marie, what parallels that you can see with how Adira is researching and her practice? Yeah, I think with Adira, um, we both sort of have sort of this kind of, I suppose, like a focal point on trying to kind of deconstruct an institution and their ways of working and their ways of sort of collecting and documenting. And I suppose from our sort of, um, our, our sort of identities are kind of very much informing how we are looking at these institutions and looking at their ways of seeing and their ways of communicating what's in their collection as well. Um, and I think what Adira's process has been very um, kind of focused, um, but also overarching because she's looking at different elements um, within the collection. So I like the fact that she's been able to kind of pick up very specific points, um, very kind of nuanced and um, detailed elements in the photograph and made those links to the original um, original material and then deconstructed that original material. So it feels as though she's kind of having a worming process as well, like really drilling in to like that particular image and providing lots of uh, scope for somebody who may not be familiar with photography or that particular image or that, or you know, how photographers make images that she's kind of providing lots of details and lots of reflections um, for people to kind of um, learn from. I sort of learned a lot from looking at her work and seeing how she's been sort of thinking. And I thought it was like kind of um, a very kind of detailed and um, excellent mind mapping sort of exercise. So yeah, definitely I think we've been kind of working in a very similar thread. And Adira, would you like to say what you feel like you've learned from understanding how Marie has tackled her residency? Absolutely. Um, I think for me, what was so interesting in looking, and I was I had been following Marie's website as the residency was progressing. And what was very interesting for me was the way that it started out with her being much more expansive um, and sort of exploring, looking at the gardens and thinking about her own body, herself, her presence, and then not sort of abandoning that even though she went into a very specific um, subject because I see all of those aspects of her own presence as a body and as a person in the work that she's made um, in this beautiful book because I think you know especially with acts like bleaching and things like that you know it's it's a really like a very tactile material way to intervene um, and I think this idea of intervention is something that we are both doing albeit in very different ways is this is this act of sort of putting oneself, putting the artist into the work. Um, 
as interpreter, but also as somebody who sort of, you know, comes into the work, disrupts it in some way. And in that act of disruption, then adds and enriches the meaning of the original work, as well as creating a new body of work too. So to sort of accompany it. And I think for me, that sort of is, is I mimicked an entire collection system, you know, so you you can sort of um, go through, uh, an alternative version of what you see in a museum um, if you come to my museum you know so in a way I, I'm sort of this um, strange collector myself I'm collecting from the museum and then I'm putting in other information into it and I think with Marie's work what is so interesting is that her work will now accompany uh, and a work that is already in the museum and so you know she has been uh, able to sort of put that put her voice in there in a very tactile and material way which is which is wonderful now there's something i'd like both of you to describe because i know that both of you have been thinking about workshops that will actually be kind of hands-on that you will be showing people kind of the process that how you work so would you like to start adira with saying about um one of the workshops a workshop that you're planning on running Yes, um, so I'm um, working on a workshop idea with Meghna uh, at MAP, and we're sort of thinking about how can we get audiences uh, to be more interested both in the Cumulus system, because I think it's a fantastic resource uh, for people to just generally go and explore mm -hmm. a museum. I have to say Nimbus is also going to be a fascinating resource for all museum goers, that your interpretation is also contributing something new and fresh. Mm. Yes, and and the workshop sort of sort of is a physical manifestation of that. Um, and our idea is that basically we'll have participants who will come in and with a set of images that they find interesting or that we select that are interesting from the museum collection. And we take printouts. And so we're sort of really working with paper and pencil and we're doing the act of cutting and cropping and interpreting a physical version of what I'm doing on Nimbus. Basically on Nimbus, I'm digitally sort of cropping into images and focusing in on details. I'm looking at other things that I can find in the both in the museum collection, but also elsewhere on the internet and um, spaces where I can connect other people into uh, what I'm doing here. And so that will be a version of that. So we'll all sit together at a table, we'll have these photographs printed, we'll work with scissors and pencils, and we'll add, we'll enrich the entries. Um, and so the idea is that people can sort of go home with an enriched entry that they've made of a museum collection, uh, ent uh, of, of an artifact in the museum collection. So that really means that, you know, we spend an afternoon actually just really close looking um, and I think something uh, you mentioned uh, Marie about Tina Kamp and of course Tina Kamp has also been very influential scholar uh, for my work as well and I think that something that she really emphasizes is this act of really paying attention um, and paying attention both in in a, in a very tactile way and I think that's something that actually is not a very academic uh, activity at all it's something that we can all do um, and I, for me, the idea is that if people are engaged uh, at looking at something, it doesn't have to be intimidating to them. And that often museum collections can be intimidating to a lot of people because they are quoted in this act of their sacred objects inside a collection and they are so precious. Um, but they are actually objects that are open to interpretation and that people, if they're, if they're willing to look and pay attention, I think, you can learn so much um, and even maybe even learn things that aren't in the collection entry details. You might even add things that the museum themselves don't know. So it's, that's a, I think that's a wonderful way to engage with any archive. Lovely. And Marie, I know that you've been um, planning a, sort of a demonstration of how you actually make and bleach your cyanotypes. Is that right? Yeah, I did a recording with uh, uh, Sean at the Horniman. Um, she works in the marketing team. Um, I did like a demonstration of how to make a cyanotype. And I also did a demonstration of how the bleaching method is. The bleaching method is um, you can use whole, household bleach if you want to, but I use sodium carbonate, um, which is like a sorting um, uh, material. Uh, yeah. Um, and I use that as part of my 
um, developing process with my analog film. So it's something that I have readily to hand. Um, and it's kind of like, a, well, I don't think it's like a non-toxic, it has like a toxicity to it. Um, so, you know, I am always acknowledging that, that there are sort of elements from my practice that are still kind of detrimental to, to the environment and photography is detrimental to the environment um, as well. Um, but for me, for me, the bleaching process has been a way for me to have agency and for me to have that kind of nuanced interpretation of certain types as well. Um, and I think it's also fun to think about the materiality of photography and how you can kind of utilise um, different materials to think how you can change the object to itself. Because, you know, you have this final piece, which is a, a perfectly formatted photograph. And um, it's been fun for me to kind of think about how we can kind of have each sound type into something quite different because you can't sort of predict the outcome of what's going to happen once the the bleaching agent hits the cyanotype paper you know you have these different um sort of interpretations so each cyanotype in itself is is very specific um as well and I like that kind of one-off you know I can't sort of repeat this again you know because I can't sort of determine and what's going to happen so kind of rescinding elements of power in the process has been quite freeing as well um because you know, you, you know as photographer we do get sort of caught up in perfectionism and you know all that sort of stuff and sometimes you just want to play and sort of not think too hard about that so um yeah well i think to kind of wrap it up now i think the nuances that both of you have brought to these museum collections has been just joyous because none of us knew how this first ever digital residency was ever going to work out. And what is so nice is that I feel like you both have made something quite special and very unique and your voices will be heard. But you have also contributed to the museum collections, which is also very special. Um, so thank you both very much. And I do feel like in your way you are contributing to people maybe understanding better about how you can approach a museum. You look and you think and you feel and you don't have to be intimidated like it's a word that you used, Adira, but in fact that you your own interpretation is as valid as anybody else's. And both of you have actually made something very creative out of this whole process. So thank you both very much indeed.